I would probably say I was always a writer. Um, um, I'm, I'm one of those lucky people who figured out early what they were good at. Um, uh, so already by the time I was done with high school, I thought being a writer and having a lot of free time, um, making things up, escaping from the world, that all sounded good to me. Um, and how I became that, uh, you know, just didn't know any better and got out of college, didn't like college very much, got out of college and it's one of the wonderful things about a novel is you, you don't have to have any professional training. It's a form of, anybody can sit down and start writing a novel, so that's what I did. But this early love for uh, literature, uh, could you try to put some words on it? Because before we write, we probably read. Oh yeah, no, I mean, what made me, what really made me a writer, I was actually just talking about it with Kathy last night. Um, uh, we were at a reading here in town, a local fiction writer, very good, named Lisa McKenzie. Um, and uh, she was talking about writing being an escape from the world, sort of you almost dissociate when you are writing and when you're reading. And she said, not that I, and her son and husband were there, she said, not that they're, I'm trying to get away from anything now, but there were earlier times in my life when it really was good to dissociate. And I, we came home from that reading and I was talking about how uh, that had been me in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, I think a lot of people have trouble with junior high school and I had a lot of trouble with junior high school. And, um, and books were, it's not that I didn't have any friends, I had a few f good friends, but I had a lot of time and life at school was so miserable for so many reasons that just to come home and then to spend all summer sitting in one chair reading, you know, for three, six, in some cases eight or ten hours, that was, that was how I survived. Um, and you pick up that habit as a young person and it, it stays with you. You become, in a sense, you have two communities. You have a community of real people, then you have a community that you form th as a reader with these writers who are not present, who you will never meet, many of whom are dead, but they are nonetheless, uh, they feel like uh, a kind of social life, it, it really. Um, and, and I did not have much of a social life back then. Mm -hmm. Those early readings, were there patterns there? Uh, because you ended up studying German. Uh, German yeah, that literature. was later. That was later. Yeah. Uh, but were it novels, were there special writers that you were interested in? Uh, you know, I didn't read that many novels um, starting out. Uh, fiction was kind of disapproved of in my household. My mother in particular thought there was something immoral about fiction. It was lies. Um, why would you read a book full of lies? This never happened. This was made up. Uh, so, um, uh, I read a lot of nonfiction, uh, a lot of science, actually, uh, which has stood me in good stead. Um, if you spend your childhood reading science, then as science proceeds, you kind of keep up with it. Um, but I was, you know, I was very, very taken with Tolkien. Um, I mean, there, there was a whole set of childhood books as well. Uh, and. In a way, Tolkien is the, the natural extension of that. They're books for grown-ups, but they're kind of children's books in a way. And, uh, and then I got into sci-fi, which was kind of my bridge from the science I'd been reading to fiction. But I didn't really encounter much good literature, even in school. The, it was ridiculously easy what you had to read. There, you know, we read Dreiser's American Tragedy. That was probably the hardest book I read in high school. Um, and I was cursing it the whole way because I thought this is, well, he's not a very good writer. Uh, I mean, he's a great writer in some respects, but page by page, he's a terrible writer. Didn't know how to use the English language. And I guess I was good enough at the English language to know Dreiser was a bad prose writer. 
but it wasn't until, until college that I really encountered literature and was made, kind of forcibly made to understand what the stakes were and why it's a great thing. And was there an aha experience uh, when you discovered kind of the real literature? Yeah, there were a couple. I mean, there was um, one of them my first semester at college. Uh, I tried to understand what Emily Dickinson was doing in a 12-line poem. It was, the hard, it was certainly intellectually the hardest thing I had ever done. I was raging because, again, I thought she was kind of a bad writer. She didn't know how to rhyme words. The words don't really rhyme right. She uses all these sort of slant rhymes. Um, <coughs> and just wrestling with these 12 lines, I can still quote the entire poem because I wrestled so hard with it. Uh, and I managed, I, normally I, I wrote easily, I would just write a lot of nonsense, a lot of bullshit in my papers, and because I wrote well, I would get A's. Um, but that wasn't the case at college. Uh, I'd tried that and I'd gotten a C and I was like, don't you know I'm supposed to get A's? So I managed to squeeze out two pages widely spaced about this poem And the professor said, yes, you've understood the poem. And I realized, first of all, that writing is a lot harder than I had any idea. Um, that you had that, the, and that what was hard about it was the thinking that had to be behind it. Um, and B, that there's more to meet, that, that meets more than meets the eye when you encounter a text that what seems like a silly, badly rhymed poem. In fact, the more you look at it, the more you find in it. So that was one. And the other, which I've written about and talked about a lot, was encountering Kafka in my last year of college. Um, and there again, similar in that um, I didn't like it initially, and I was forcibly made to understand how badly I'd been reading. And once I, once I really started reading it sentence by sentence and not reading what I thought was there, but reading what was actually there, everything changed. Mm -hmm. there's, a <clears throat> certain, there's a certain similarity between reading and escaping the world and writing. Nicole Krauss once told me the wonderful thing about being a writer is you only have one life, but you can create any life you want to be any character, you can be an old man, you can be a child, whatever. Uh, do you see that the same, that writing in a way gives you endless possibilities? Like a video game, extra lives. Um, uh, yeah, maybe when I was Nicole Krause's age, that's how it looked to me. Now I realize what you can actually do well It's not, <laughs> it's not a whole lot bigger than the sum of what you've lived uh, and what you've encountered, the people you've encountered, the situations you've been in, the emotions you've experienced. Um, there is something deeply wonderful about setting out to create a character from scratch. Um, the word novel has novelty in it. You were doing something, I am creating on the page, these little ink characters, I'm creating something that will be experienced as if it's kind of a real person that has never existed. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, part of, that's part of how fiction writing feels like a drug to me. It's like you're, you know, you're getting the drug ready when you're trying to create those characters. Um, and then, of course, there's the wonderful year when you're actually getting to use those characters. And some of the characters, they follow you for, for years. I've read that some of the characters in Purity, you already had thought of for... Oh, yeah. Ever. Well, that's, that gets back to what I'm was saying about there there really isn't an infinity of possibilities it's you are if you're a character driven novelist as i totally am for to me that's the main work is 
developing interesting, lovable characters. Um, the ones who can really come alive and stay with you and I think have a possibility of staying with the reader, they will usually correspond to pretty primary psychological objects. Um, people, people who haunt your dreams, people who made it some kind of impression, um, or, or projections of self that you've been projecting for so long that they start to take on a kind of solidity, um, alter egos. Uh, and they are limited in number. Many, many novelists, many really good novelists never create a great character. Um, and even in the case of the very best, you think of Faulkner, it's still a limited number. You know, he had maybe 15, 18 great characters. That's all he could do. Um, and those were obviously characters of immense significance to the inside of Faulkner. There is a, a tone in your books that is recognizable and a kind of handwriting, I believe. But there are also some themes. Um, all the books, or most of the books, is about families and the surface and families falling apart. Uh, does every author or novelist, you say you have a limited number of possibilities, but are you writing the same book or the same theme, the same story all over again? Um, yeah, I would probably make a distinction between technique and theme. Um, and the subject of family is not very interesting to me as a subject. Um, it's just that as a technique of creating immediate emotionally charged situations, family is extremely useful. Um, as a means of simplifying how the various characters relate to one another, it's great. You say mother, son, you say father, daughter, you've got s it's like we snap right into it. You do not have to spend pages and pages, chapters and chapters, developing how these people are in relation. They just automatically are because they're brothers or they're a child and a parent. Um, so I was prepared by my own childhood to really take an interest in and um, have a pretty good understanding of the way families work. And so it, um, because I had kind of an amazing family, just these giant characters, um, and I was in the middle kind of, but sort of, I was both in the middle and I was also an outsider. Like all the main stuff had happened before I was born um, or before I was 10 years old. Um, so I was both very much in the center and very much on the outside. And so I think that's one reason why that, that became a favored technique. And, and you know, another, another signature, another, I, I think there's kind of a comic tone to all of the novels. And there again, it's not like that corresponds to some, well, I've made it into kind of a theoretical point. I've, I, I will argue that humor is a vital ingredient in fiction and that no novelist should be without it. But the fact is, you know, it's just something I could do. And so um, to the extent that there's a humor in the voice or humor at the center, irony on one side, satire on another, but that kind of spectrum, that just, um, again, that's my native voice. Uh, it's how I am in just ordinary life. Um, I like to laugh, I like to make people laugh. And, um, and, it was a, it, and it was a useful strategy of coping in an intense family. Mm. So, so a lot of these things that seem like possible, you know, themes or, or signatures are really just, you know, what you have at, at hand when you turn 21 and set out to be a writer. It's like, eh, 
I had this family and I had this, this way of laughing at it. Um, and, and you go from there. I didn't at all mean to label uh, your books. Uh, what I find is that you are questioning the surface. You have something on the surface. Yeah. And you look behind it and you take it apart. Um, I find complexity, ambiguity, contradiction interesting. Um, and there again, I can make a kind of theoretical argument about literature's role in uh, providing a sense of the tr tragic ambiguity of life, you know, anything like that. But in fact, it's that um, it's just more interesting. Pages are more interesting if if you're blowing something open, um, and. And it has to do, I think, with, um, you know, ultimately I'm trying to entertain. I'm trying to give the reader a good time. And, uh, and for me as a reader, part of a good time is a sense of, wow, this is so interesting. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not, it's not simple. Um, and and because I'm so committed to books, they have an almost religious role in my life. Um, part of what serious readers look for in a book is, this, is an impression of depth, possibly infinite depth. If you look at someone like Alice Munro, seemingly simple stuff, and as she herself has said, you just you realize that in any situation, there is no limit to how many layers you can go down. You think you've gotten to the bottom, and it turns out you can go even deeper. And things get even more complicated and interesting when you do. Um, her particular genius is to manage to get that sensation of depth into these short stories. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. You're such a vivid storyteller, even though your books are six, seven, eight hundred pages long. Five hundred fifty in English. Oh well, I've, I have the German translation. Oh That's boy. No, but you're such a. From page one, you are into the story, and I have the feeling there is a man who really loves to tell a story. Could, sure. Could you tell me something about your your writing process when you're not giving interviews, but you're sitting at your desk writing, or or more like it. Mostly I sit at my desk and don't write and think about why I'm unable to write. Um, well, Godard said all you need is a girl and a gun um, to make a movie. Uh, fiction writer, yeah, you can, make, you can write a novel with a girl and a gun, but w I, I, what I would say you need is you need a problem and you need a tone. Um, and if you've got, if you if you're hearing it, if the sentences pop with a particular tone, and you have taken care to set up a problem, right on page one. Um, there you go, you're in. It's it's you know, makes it sound simple, but you can spend four or five years wandering in the desert looking for the tone and the problem. Because it's got to be the right tone, it's got to be the right problem. But that's, it really, at this point it feels that simple to me. Um, Are you becoming your characters while writing them? No, not really. Um, in the same way that there's a, a kind of magic, as you sit quietly, whatever, in an airport lounge, reading a book, and somehow you are experiencing, rather vividly, something that is simply not present. Um, there's a perfect inverse in the way in which the mechanical process of putting words on the page, starting to write a sentence. After a sentence or two, you are in that dream, but it's not 
It's an interesting thing because there, there are many parts of the brain working simultaneously. You, uh, you know, I am, at this point, it's become almost second nature, but not quite second nature. I am, I am worrying about punctuation. Even though I'm completely in the dream, I'm so aware that I'm also putting words on the page. So I'm worried about varying sentence structure and I'm, you know, I'm monitoring adverb use. I'm doing all of these things. Um, so, which it, if I were really being the character, I would just, you know, supposedly be oblivious of. So I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it makes any sense to talk about becoming a character. You're, you're still the writer, but you're the writer having this dream. In Europe, especially in Germany, which where I come from, I didn't realize that you're German. I'm German. That's yeah. why you're reading the books in German, not because there aren't great Danish translations. No, we have we so. have the, we have the Danish version. Das hätten wir auf Deutsch. Das hätten wir auf Deutsch machen können. No, and but in Europe, anyhow, we <clears throat> have this relationship to our writers that we love them as writers, but we see them as intellectuals as well. Right. And uh, every time we go to war or there's a political question, we call them and ask them for their opinion. I know it's, it's we Americans look on with envy. If only we were taken so seriously. Yeah. What's your opinion? Does, does the writer, does the intellectuals have a special role to play in society? <sighs> Not particularly in America. Um, you know, if we ever happen to fall into having a fascist government, Writers tend to be on the front lines when freedom of expression is under attack. Um, it is under attack a little bit now, but it's always under attack. The mode of attack has varied by the decades. You had one kind in the late 40s, early 50s with the Red Scare. and It sort of comes from the opposite direction now with the sort of tyranny of PC language. Um, but basically, some of the functions of the writer in European culture are actually embedded in the Bill of Rights here, particularly freedom of expression. So it is, you know, we have, we have an entire judicial system looking after that. So writers don't have to play that role. And I think um, this is, this is not an intellectual country. It has been, continues to be in many parts of it, an anti-intellectual country. So the writer has to, writers really are viewed more as providers of fun, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, it's a little different with poets. We have poet laureates and they're expected to do a poem when the president is inaugurated. And, um, you know, we do, you know, in the civil rights movement, many writers were active in that. A lot of writers were opposed to the second Iraq war. Um, but no, I, should we? Uh, it's not that I don't enjoy being an intellectual. Um, I have a whole second life as an essayist even a polemicist um, and social critic, environmental crusader in my own little way. Um, but I, I, I see those as option, optional. I don't, I don't think less of an American writer who doesn't choose to do that. Um, and and I do think it usefully keeps American writers from taking themselves too seriously. You know, there's a, um, yeah, plenty of American writers do manage to take themselves too seriously, but I, I, they look a little ridiculous because the country doesn't take them seriously. The freedom of expression is guaranteed by the Constitution, yeah, but there are some social tendencies. Uh, you have been critical of social media, for example. Uh, <clears throat> I called Twitter stupid, <laughs> which was merely stating a fact. Hmm. But there are, um, the reason for my question, there are 
tendencies, not only political ones, but social ones, um, that change our society and the way we live together and communicate together. Is that something for a writer? Is that something for Jonathan Franzen to be engaged in? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I play for team literature, and so I'm on the lookout for things that threaten the team. And, uh, and you know, my understanding of the threat changes as time goes by. Um, in the 90s, I was very concerned with the new designer drugs and uh, the, you know, the hegemony of television and more recently it's, people are so distracted by their little handheld devices um, that it's, it, it is demonstrably harder to sh shut everything off and actually experience a book. Um, and I think there are certain discourses, um, some of them neurobiological, some of them social, that discourage the entire enterprise of digging deep inside. It's actually much more pleasant not to get into the hot stuff inside if you can, and I think people's relation, people are shifting a lot of energy that they formerly put into human relations into technologically mediated relations in which the most salient feature is actually that it's technological, not that it's a relationship with other human beings. Um, we are kind of consigning more and more of our lives to interaction essentially with robots and with not with real people, but with people who we've carefully edited, taking only the part that's useful or interesting to us. Um, and all of that, you know, that's kind of attacking the ground from which literature springs. So, yeah, I, I feel some responsibility to speak out. You said you're on team literature, and as a writer you want to entertain, but surely literature is more than entertainment. Why is literature still important for all of us? Um, this, is, this is a question that often comes up when I talk, particularly with German interviewers. Um, and I think, I think the, the word Unterhaltung has a very different valence in Germany than entertainment does here. Um, maybe it's as simple that Americans don't mind just, you know, being entertained, but it's also, I think, I think our sense of entertainment leaves open the possibility of being intellectually entertained. And Unterhaltungsliteratur is just not that. It's in fact the word is set up to distinguish it from serious literature. Um, so uh, to me there's, there's, there's not so much a contradiction, but I do think that um, I don't think people change, well people in general just don't change very much. To the extent that people change at all it's because of some encounter that has love in it. Um, you, will, you will change your feelings, your homophobic feelings will disappear eventually when someone in your family who you love comes out. Uh, and in the same way, um, and I think that's just true on down the line, love is what changes people. And so if, if you take literature seriously and you think you might be changed by a book, that's not going to happen unless you love the book. So you're putting the cart before the horse if you take all of your serious intention and wish to change and put it ahead of establishing a relationship with the reader that is founded on love. And 
In other words, the reader has to love the book, has to be feeling like I, some, I love some part of it. I love that story, or I love this character, or I love, you know, I love these descriptions because they remind me so much of the inside of my, you know, whatever it is, you have to establish that love and what, and, and of course, what, what is love but pleasure in the company of, you know, there, it's other things, but it, so, so I think pleasure actually always has to come first. And it's a, and it, and you get into, you start to self-marginalize as a novelist if you take yourself so seriously, you think you don't have to worry about the reader experiencing pleasure. So books, literature, can change people. They have the power to change people, maybe save people. As there are other boys like you, were in ninth grade, and flew into literature. Yes. I mean, save is a strong word for what literature can do, but um, I have felt saved by books. I can name them at various points, usually, usually in dark periods, um, to, f to happen upon a book that, that seems to be speaking directly to me even though the author didn't know me. Um, uh, it helps. It's one of it's a it's a truly good thing in the world that you can pick up this product that consists of paper and ink, and you can have an experience, a really deep experience of feeling less alone. Um, uh, There are still misfits. There will always be misfits. There's probably some simple genetic reason why we will never become completely conformist. Um, and I think, I do worry that the power of technology is so strong that we will see fewer people able to find the private space in which to develop a relationship with books. Um, I worry also that it will become increasingly the province of the very privileged. The privileged don't let their kids be on video screens night and day. It's the unprivileged who do that. Um, nevertheless, I think there will always be people. And, I, and I'm very heartened when I go out on these tours um, and see a lot of young people there. And they, they've, you know, there may be fewer of them, but they're, they're all the more precious and they're really, in many ways, much more spectacularly solid people than I was when I was their age. Um, so yeah. <laughs>